Okay, we're live. Um, w welcome everyone, thanks for hanging in uh, while we uh, dealt with uh, technical difficulties here um, in our first uh, seminar series of the semester. Uh, my name is Joe Cable, I'm the director of MindCore and I wanted to welcome everyone uh, today. Uh, and I know that many of the people in the audience um, have been with us for several years at MindCore, but for those of you who might be new to Penn this semester or who might be joining us um, from, uh, from outside uh, for our talk today, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to who we are and what we do. Uh, the MIND Center for Outreach, Research, and Education, or MindCore, is Penn's uh, hub for the integrative study of the mind. Uh, we think that understanding how people think feel and act is intrinsically interesting, uh, but also practically important. Uh, you don't need to look far in the midst of a global pandemic for examples of how through our own behavior, uh, people are our own worst enemies. Uh, and we think that building that understanding of how people think, feel and act uh, is going to require bringing together insights and tools and most importantly, people from many disciplinary backgrounds, from neurobiology to ethology to psychology to linguistics to anthropology to computer science to philosophy. And so that's what our mission is. Um, our seminar series, uh, our seminar committee has put together a great uh, group of speakers for an online series this fall, um, all of whom uh, are great examples of people who are doing fascinating cutting edge research that addresses big unanswered questions about the mind. Um, and I am delighted to see a familiar face and an old friend to kick us off. Um, it's going to take all of my self-control to not introduce her, but instead hand off to her host uh, to introduce. Um, uh, one last announcement before I do that. Um, these uh, links are freely available to anyone anywhere. Um, so uh, please feel free to share our Crowdcast uh, with any colleagues you know around the world who might be interested uh, in hearing about but work addressing these big unanswered questions about the mind. And so with that, I'm gonna hand off to the host for today, uh, John Truswell, uh, who will introduce our speaker and take us from here. All right, great. Uh, welcome everyone to the MindCore seminar series. I'm John Truswell, I'm a professor in the psychology department. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the year, uh, Marina Bedney. It's very appropriate that Marina is the first speaker since uh, Marina is a, a Penn PhD alum uh, and uh, has gone on to do great things uh, in her own research uh, over the past few years. So currently Marina is an associate professor at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University in the Department of Psych Psychological and Brain Sciences and uh, the Department of Cognitive Science. Uh, she went to Hopkins as an undergraduate, in fact, uh, where she earned her BA in cognitive science. And soon after that, uh, uh, happily, she came to Penn for graduate school. Um, and, and she was in our uh, very own PhD program in psychology. This is where I got to know Marina well. Um, she was a, an exceptional student. Uh, here, uh, her advisor was uh, Sharon Thompson Schill. And Marina collaborated with Sharon on a range of topics uh, uh, concerning how frontal lobe systems support cognitive control and language processing. Um, and immediately after that, uh, she uh, went to um, MIT and uh, the Harvard Medical School, uh, where she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. And there she really developed her passion for studying uh, the minds and brains of uh, blind individuals, uh, which we're going to hear a little bit about today, I'm sure. And uh, a key approach to uh, her in her lab at Hopkins compares really the mental life of people with different developmental experiences, sighted people, congenitally blind people, late blind individuals, and also uh, people with different kinds of expertise on topics, which we'll also be hearing about today. Um, one direction of research examines how people who are born blind think about so-called visual concepts. Like it's, uh, it's rather amazing to uh, find out that uh, blind individuals uh, know about concept, uh, know about concepts and make distinguishes like, distinctions like we do for verbs like glimmer uh, and uh, and the like. Uh, 
And also another line work, uh, of work examines what the visual co uh, cortex does in blind individuals and uh, what this can say about neuroplasticity. Um, so with that, uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome uh, Marina back to Penn, at least virtually. It's really a shame she's not back on campus where we can all meet with her individually. Uh, and today she's going to be uh, talking, uh, 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 giving a talk entitled Built to Learn, Insights into Nature and Nurture from Blindness and Cognitive Expertise. So I'm going to hand it off to Marina. Thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction. Um, let me know if there's any trouble hearing me. Um, it's a great honor uh, to be back at Penn, even if only virtually, and I do wish I were there to um, say hello to old friends and talk with people. Um, so I'm gonna start the slide presentation. And after a little bit of wrangling, it turns out there's no way for me to see you guys and see my present um, presentation at the same time. So I'm gonna not see anyone, but I do love questions. So um, if you wanna ask questions, maybe um, John can kind of let me know as they come up or we can address them at the end. Okay, here we go. Can you All hear right. me uh, for yes, a second? I, can. I, I just wanted to say that if there were um, questions that come up, uh, type them in and I will be monitoring it and I'll jump in and, and ask questions as we go along. So my first question is, if um, can you guys see my slides okay? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, no notes, just my slides. Fantastic. Okay. So um, today I want to talk to you about um, some of the work that we've been doing for the past um, few years on this question that I've been interested in for kind of the entirety of my life, which is what is the contribution of um, experience as opposed to innate predispositions to the way that our mind and brain works? Um, and the way that uh, we try, or one way we try to address this really um, deep and complicated question is by finding slices um, in the world where people's experiences vary in interesting ways so that we can disentangle um, the contributions of these unique aspects of experience to the way that the mind and brain works. And for the most part, um, the, uh, the way that my lab has approached this problem is by working with people who are born blind. Um, and that's what most of this talk will be about. So understanding what blindness can tell us about um, where concepts and uh, neural organization comes from. But as hopefully I'll get to at the end of the talk, I have a really cool new graduate student in my lab whose name is Yumfei, um, who is a Python connoisseur as he calls himself, um, and he started a new research program in the lab um, comparing the minds of computer programmers um, uh, to understand uh, cognitive expertise. And so at the end, I'll tell you about one project, which is kind of our beginning entry into this field, and hopefully um, it'll all fit together at the end. So to start with, um, what, what is the question that we're, we're after? So the question I'm interested in um, and the lab is interested in is how experience contributes to the mind and brain. And so why might we wanna work with people who are blind to try to address this question? Um, and there are two reasons um, primarily that we look at this question. One is that um, blindness uh, is a way to understand how visual experience contributes to knowledge. Um, so by comparing the minds and brains of people who grow up with and without vision, we can ask what aspects of what we know um, come from seeing. So we know that we see faces and movement and light in the world. Um, to what degree does learning about the world without that kind of information change the way that we think about the world? A second reason that I think um, studying blindness is interesting is um, because of neuro neuroplasticity, right? So as primates, we have about a quarter of our brain devoted to various kinds of visual perception, like um, you know, uh, motion detection, color perception, line orientation, face processing. And one question we could ask is, well, what happens to this part of the brain when it doesn't receive its so-called species typical input, namely vision? Um, does it atrophy? Well, we've known for a while it doesn't. Does it take on new functions? What, what are those functions? And what does that tell us about um, the way that experience contributes to um, brain organization? So before I get to the data themselves, I should say a little bit about the population of people that um, these studies were conducted with. So most of the work I'll be telling you about was done with people who are born blind. Um, and these are individuals who are blind due to some um, problem with their eyes, 
or optic nerve, so not due to brain damage. And the kinds of conditions that um, these individuals have are things like Leber's congenital amaurosis, retinopathy of prematurity, um, and ophthalmia, so conditions that affect um, the eye or optic nerve, but not the brain. These individuals are totally blind with at most minimal light perception, um, and they have no cognitive or neurological disabilities. When we start, first started doing this work, we were just asking people the question of whether they had ever been diagnosed, and um, we, st we still do that, but we also now administer um, some standardized tests. Um, to, to our participants. And then the um, performance and um, neural responses of these individuals will be compared to um, cited agent education matched controls, as well as towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit of data from people who become blind um, as adults. Um, and if so, this is who we're testing is important. So if there are any questions about that, um, you should ask. Okay. So the first, um, the first question that I want to talk to you about is um, the role of vision and the role of sensory experience in general um, in shaping um, our concepts. This is an age old question of interest to um, thinkers over the centuries in many different places. So this is a quote from John Locke, um, one of the British empiricists who um, believed that uh, people who are born blind um, could have no genuine understanding of visual ideas. So here's um, what he said about rainbows, but yet that definition, how exact and perfect soever, would never make a blind man understand it because several of the simple ideas that make that complex one, being as such as he never received by sensation and experience, no words are able to excite them in the mind. So um, Locke's idea was that if you've never had the basic sensory experiences to ground your concept of rainbow or yellow um, or sparkle, then truly you could have no genuine understanding of this concept. And of course, I'm pointing out here um, the seminal work done by Barbara Landau and Lila Gleitman on the subject when they documented um, knowledge of um, children who are born, born blind. Um, and so we're picking up on this work and I'll tell you a little bit of what we've done um, to kind of ask empirically rather than through thought experiments, uh, what do blind people actually know about visual ideas? So this study, um, I'm gonna go through a little bit quickly um, because uh, despite the fact that it was just published, it's, the data are now a little bit old um, to get to some new work. But um, in this experiment, we used uh, uh, visual verbs to test blind and sighted people's understanding of visual ideas. So we did a very simple experiment where participants saw pairs of words and had to decide on a scale of one to seven, how related a meaning they were. Um, and we had a bunch of uh, visual perception verbs like glimpse, um, peer, scan, and spot. Um, and also um, light emission verbs like flare, shine, glisten, and flicker. And then a bunch of words from other modalities like tactile verbs, emodal verbs, and auditory verbs. And the verbs were paired with all possible um, other verbs within their broad grammatical class. And then, uh, you know, th this was a very long survey. Participants would do it online. Blind participants use screen readers to do this experiment. Um, it took overall um, about eight hours. Um, and there were thousands of questions, but people would log in, they would do this for half an hour, and then they would log out. Um, so it was not so burdensome. And I'm just gonna show you a slice of data from this experiment um, to give you a flavor for what we found. So these are data from um, light emission verbs, but the results are qualitatively and actually pretty quantitatively similar um, for, for the visual perception verbs. What we found is that, um, uh, so what I'm showing you in the, um, uh, in the uh, correlation plot um, to the bottom right corner is the correlation between um, the similarity judgments for just the visual verbs, so leaving aside all the other um, classes to look at the more fine-grained decisions, for two groups of sighted people and for one group of blind people and one group of sighted people. And so the question we were trying to address here is whether the meanings of two groups of sighted people are more similar to each other than the meanings of a blind group and a sighted group. And what we found was that that was not the case, that there was high agreement on which uh, light perception verbs were more similar to each other, um, just as high among blind and sighted people as among sighted people. Um, and at the top, you see an MDS plot 
uh, which gives you a flavor for the kinds of information that blind and sighted people know about these verbs. So the two dimensions that come out um, for these verbs are intensity and instability, which are the two dimensions that linguists have identified as being important to the meanings of these words. And so words like um, blaze are intense and stable. By contrast, words like um, twinkle are both unstable and low in intensity. And these are the kinds of information that blind and sighted people share. And what the bar graphs show you um, is individual subject correlation metrics. So here's where we take one blind person and we correlate them to the rest of their group, or we could take one blind person and we correlate them to the sighted group. And the reason this is important to do is you could imagine that on average, blind people converge on the same meanings as sighted people, but individual blind people show a lot of variability. And this turns out not to be the case. There's no more variability among blind people um, than among sighted people. Julia Ellie, um, a graduate student in my laboratory who recently uh, graduated and is now a postdoc with Susan Gelman, um, followed uh, up Marina, on- Marina? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I actually do have a, a question that came right. up already. Um, and um, it's from uh, Lyle Lunger. And apologies, Lyle, if you had that question up for a while because uh, I didn't have the window open correctly to see the questions to begin with, apparently. Uh, but um, I think it's a, pro a, a good question to ask right now, which is that, um, you know, he, he, Lyle writes, given that computers do an excellent job of rating the similarities of such words when the computers are only trained on text alone and have no vision, uh, this, with all due uh, deference to Locke, uh, hardly seems surprising, right? Um, so um, in, the, in the context of this result here, of course, I mean, it starts pointing to a mechanism, perhaps, right, of how the blind are, are doing this. Um, do you want to comment at all about that right now? About you know, so text analysis systems would, perhaps, if you were to ask um, Google, uh, Ngram, uh, something like that, uh, might generate a similar space. Have you have you looked to see? Um, and it, it's essentially a question of of the information. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think um, I, I will say something brief about it now, but then we can, um, I think we'll dig into it more as we, as we go on. Um, so the, the first thing to say about it at the time that we did the study, which was a little while ago, um, we tried to use the then kind of current version of um, latent semantic analysis style analyses and didn't get very far. So they um, it did much uh, more poorly relative to, so there was the similarity between that um, those uh, analyses and humans was much lower. However, for these data, we haven't redone it in a little while, but um, so for um, the data that I'm gonna show you uh, later, there have been um, some analyses and actually Gary Lupian did some analyses both for these verbs and for um, the future data that I will show you. Um, and the bottom line seems to be is that, um, so, so first of all, of course, um, blind individuals don't get this information by magic. Um, and I think that uh, language probably plays a, a big role in how blind individuals learn this information. Empirically, um, for the um, cases that have been tried so far, the last kind of latest kind of cut, cutting edge text algorithms don't do um, quite as well as blind participants and the patterns are not exactly the same for the data sets that have been tried, but they do, do, they do get a bunch of information out. What I think remains um, entirely unclear is the way that um, the algorithms get the information and the way that the blind participants get the information, right? So um, it, that the information is partly in the language is entirely clear, but um, whether blind individuals are learning it by um, tracking co-occurrences or even neighborhood statistics of words um, uh, is, is not clear and is not possible to address by studying the algorithms at this point. The experiment that I will tell you about at the end of this portion of the talk, I think also raises a new example, um, which I think raises a new lower bar for what these algorithms could learn that I suspect is not learnable. This um, is learnable to a point. Okay. All right, thanks. Well, we can maybe we can talk about it. At that, the end. Very cool. Thanks. Nice answer is what Lyle just wrote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so I, I guess related to this question, um, there, there are different ways to take what you're saying and it provides good motivation for the next study, right? So 
one possibility is, you know, are blind individuals getting this information from language? But another one is how is this information being represented? So maybe um, blind individuals are representing this information in a qualitatively different way from people who are sighted, who represent it in a sensory way. And certainly there's not really a um, bottom line way to address this in a full stop manner, but I think neural data can provide a little bit of evidence to the puzzle. Um, and so Julia Ellie, what she did was she ran an fMRI experiment where blind and sighted participants did similar kinds of semantic similarity judgments, but this time um, in an fMRI scanner and she me measured neural responses to light verbs, but also sound verbs, hand action verbs, mouth action verbs and a bunch of different kinds of nouns and again i'm going to tell you only a little bit about a little bit of these data um so the first thing i want to show you is what happens when you compare um uh, for blind individuals and for sighted individuals responses to the verbs relative to the nouns so what you find is that both blind and sighted people recruit um, this uh, left middle temporal gyrus uh, brain region um, for verbs over nouns and a network of areas including um, uh, the entreparietal sulcus inferior temporal areas as well as precuneous regions which i'm not showing you uh, for the nouns more than for the verbs so at least uh, for those big um, types of words the recruitment is similar across these groups and then when you look at activity um, in the uh, middle temporal gyrus, which is the region that is most active for verbs, both in sighted and blind individuals, um, the red bar is showing responses to light verbs. So what you can see is that this region um, is responding to these words, both in blind and in sighted people. It's not like um, it, it's kind of missing the response. So this provides some evidence for the idea that there's a common neural resource in, in play. Um, the other thing that Julia found was that um, using patterns of activation within the left middle temporal gyrus and um, the precuneus in this case, but this is true also for other noun responsive regions, she could decode um, different semantic categories of verbs and nouns. But what's interesting is so in the left middle temporal gyrus, you can decode verbs better than nouns, um, uh, shown, verbs shown in red and nouns shown in blue. And that's true both for blind and sighted people, but um, in the uh, precuneus and the intraparietal sulcus, you decode nouns better than verbs. And again, that is true both for blind and for sighted people. So that suggests that there's a common network of neural areas involved in processing these words across these individuals. As I said though, um, uh, the, you could uh, argue, like, are these just lexical word representations? And what does it mean to um, learn from language? This is kind of related to um, the question that Lila asked. And so to dig, dig a little bit deeper into this kind of um, question, um, Judy Kim in my laboratory, and um, along with Julia as a collaborator, studied um, what blind and sighted people know about the appearance um, of language of animals and how they learn this information. Um, so again, this was a large experiment. I'm going to tell you only about a subset of the task. Um, so what, what in this particular task, Judy and Julia presented um, blind and sighted participants with a sorting um, uh, paradigm where they received um, names of animals uh, either in braille for blind, and part blind participants or um, written in visual print for people who are sighted. And they had to sort the animals according to various dimensions. So like according to shape, according to texture and according to color. And the approach we took was similar to what we did for the verbs is we asked whether the similarity spaces generated by blind individuals are different or similar to those generated by sighted people. Um, and so what Judy and Julia found was um, a couple of interesting things. So first of all, um, there's a lot of shared information among blind and sighted people. And so the bottom, um, first I'm showing you the sim similarity matrices at the top um, across different animals for shape, texture, and color. Um, and at the bottom is correlation uh, uh, values among sighted people in red, among blind people in blue, and blind to sighted in, pur in purple. So the bottom line is that blind and sighted people share a bunch of information, but they share some information more than others. So shape information is shared more um, by blind and sighted people than texture information, which is um, both are shared much more than color. Um, and the question is, why is that? So one possibility, it's because color is uniquely visually accessible, whereas in shape, you could in principle um, access through touch, although not um, specifically for lions, but maybe blind individuals have a representational space um, for shape rather than color. Um, 
Another possibility is that um, color is more difficult to verbalize. So this is again related to the idea um, that we were talking about before, which is um, the things that get talked about are the things that get learned and the things that don't get talked about don't. Um, so one of the things that, um, this was actually the, this, the second option is the one that I had the thought uh, would be true, which turned out to be completely false. Um, so the way that Judy measured this um, was using verbalizability. So she looked at the piles, the color piles, the skin texture piles, and the shape piles that participants made in the sorting task. Um, and she asked how easy was it for people to verbalize what the categories were. Um, and then she measured the Simon's Diversity Index, which basically measures how concise um, and how diagnostic the labels are that people are providing. And what you find is that color is actually super easy to verbalize. So participants said things like black, white, brown, uh, black and white. Those are the kinds of categories, the um, piles that they made. By contrast, for shape, it was really difficult to describe kind of once you see the data or once I saw the data, I thought, duh, right? It's it's kind of difficult to describe the shape of an elephant. Um, so th it doesn't seem like overt information in the language um, is the relevant variable. What Judy found though, was that um, color was the, the only dimension um, of perceptual space that is not inferable from evolutionary distance, right? So if you um, think about the taxonomic categories of animals, right, fish um, have a similar shape to each other. Um, uh, uh, terrestrial mammals, large mammals have a similar shape to each other, but color is much more difficult to predict, right? So a swan is white and so is a polar bear. You can't infer that um, from their taxonomic category. And so the idea here is that what's happening is blind individuals are able to infer um, the shape and texture of animals using taxonomy. And one of the pieces of evidence for this, um, apart from these correlations, is the kind of disagreements that we found among blind and sighted people. So for example, um, blind individuals, um, so, so the, the, these disagreements went kind of both ways. One item that I particularly like is that sighted people um, often said that sharks have skin um, and I think that's because they kind of look smooth and glossy. By contrast, all blind participants said that sharks have scales. And the idea there is that blind individuals are inferring um, scales from taxonomy, whereas inside of people are getting it from their perceptual experience. Okay. Okay. So what I'm suggesting here is that blind individuals are learning appearance through inference um, rather than merely by memorizing what labels are being stated. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do, um, what Judy wanted to do actually was to dig um, more deeply into what blind individuals actually know about color, because I think the idea that blind um, color is uniquely difficult to know um, remains viable, right? I've given you one story for why color is not acquired um, in this particular um, domain, but that's just kind of one explanation. So what, what we wanted to know is, which are the kinds of things that blind individuals do share with sighted about color? What kind of knowledge is shared and which kind of knowledge is not shared? So in this experiment, um, Judy asked um, blind and sighted participants to um, uh, make inferences about colors um, to know which are the pieces of knowledge that blind and sighted people know um, uh, share and which, which don't they share. So in this experiment, um, Judy presented blind and sighted participants with two um, questions. The first one was, what is a common color of a lemon? What is a common color of a leaf? What is a common color of a car? And this is primarily the kind of knowledge that we and other people have tested before, which is basically associative color knowledge, like what is the color of this object? But then she asked people, if you picked two leaves at random, how likely would they be to have the same color? Maybe you can do this mentally for yourself now on a scale of one to seven with one is unlikely and seven is very likely. How likely are, maybe you could type it in the in the text, text chat. How likely are two leaves to have the same color? And then you can do the same thing for a car. What is the common color of a car? If you pick two cars at random, how likely are they to have the same color? And you can do the same for paper, right? Um, but then you can flip the question. And so instead of asking about, um, uh, lemons and leaves and cars and paper, uh, which separate, so they separate into natural kinds, artifacts and artifacts with functional colors. 
you can ask about usage. Um, so instead of asking about color, you would ask, what is a common thing you can do with a leaf? If you picked um, two people at random and asked each of them to do something with a leaf, how likely are they to do the same thing? And so again, rate it mentally for yourself or in the chat window with one is very unlikely and seven very likely, and then do the same thing with a car. So what is a common thing you could do with a car? And if you pick two people at random, how likely are they to do the same thing? So the logic of this experiment is the following. Um, uh, natural kinds, artifacts, and artifacts with functional colors have a different causal structure, right? They get their colors by virtue of different um, causal mechanisms. So leaves have a um, color by virtue of their nature or their DNA, whereas in cars have a um, color by virtue of human choice. And the question is, whether or not blind and sighted people share the associative color facts, do they share these causal models? So the first thing I'm showing you is the associative uh, color facts knowledge among blind and sighted people. And so what you um, what you see here, so basically, if um, people share all of their knowledge, uh, this graph would look entirely dark blue. Um, so what you can see already is that um, if you compare the top and the bottom for sighted and blind people, there's more variability in associative color knowledge um, among blind individuals than among sighted people. There's some variability for the sighted as well, particularly for the objects with no uh, non-functional colors like cars, but much more variability for the blind participants. So this suggests there's some truth to this idea that there's um, this uh, kind of associative color knowledge is not shared um, as much by blind and sighted people. But this is the um, answers to the question that I told you about before. So first I'm showing you the data for the usage question for the blind and sighted people with natural kinds in green and artifacts in blue, um, non-functional artifacts. And what you can see is that hopefully just like you have the intuition, people say that um, cars are more likely to have the same usage um, than natural kinds like leaves or lemons. Um, and you find in blind, in sighted people, the reverse pattern for um, color. So for color, people say lemons are very likely to have the same color. By contrast, artifacts are not. And what's um, and for artifacts with functional colors, which I think is an important um, kind of category, um, they look more like natural kinds because for these items, um, there's a usage to the color. So paper is presumably white, so you can see the markings that you make on it. Um, and so sighted people um, have these intuitions. And it turns out that blind people do too, right? So blind individuals share these intuitions about um, uh, the consistency of color across different object types, despite not sharing the associative knowledge. I think what's really, what's also interesting and, and important to show here is that um, these, uh, it's not just that blind individuals have this knowledge for real objects, right? So you could, think, for example, that still um, the responses are being based on the imperfect, but nevertheless, um, some shared associative color knowledge among blind and sighted people. So some blind individuals know that polar bears are white um, and that cars are commonly red, right, and also different other colors. But what um, Judy showed is that blind and sighted people can also make these inferences for novel categories with which nobody has any experiences. So for example, she gave people this novel island scenario and she said, um, you know, this, is, this island has a new ecology, a different um, culture. Um, and so you might notice um, a miner excavating a green gem that is spiky and the size of a hand. It appears that to be vibrating in place, the miners, um, tell you that this gem is called an Enli and so on. And then she asked, um, how likely is that, that the next time you see an Enli, it will be green? And then she did the same thing for artifacts, um, both with functional and non-functional colors, functional ones including things like um, money. And what you find is that blind and sighted people show the exact same pattern for these novel objects as they do um, for, uh, for real objects. So what does this mean? Um, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, right there is a question, but uh, let you finish this. What does this mean part? And then I'll okay, ask okay, you. yeah. So, um, so what does this mean? So, before I kind of get to that, I the the last thing I will add is that we also collected open ended explanations, color explanations for blind from blind and sighted participants, and what we found is that blind and sighted people gave analogously causal explanations even when they disagreed about the colors of the items. Um, so, for example. Um, Mo all sighted people said polar bears are white. 
Some cited blind people said polar bears are white, but a bunch um, of blind participants said polar bears are black. Um, and they explained that um, to be in this Arctic environment, you need to absorb heat. And so polar bears evolved to be black um, to absorb heat in the environment. Turns out that polar bears underneath their white fur um, have black skin for this exact purpose, which I didn't know until I did the study. Um, and just basically putting it together, the idea is that blind and sighted people um, preserve intuitive theories of um, visual knowledge and causal theories of visual knowledge, despite not sharing um, color facts. All right, question, please. Yeah, the, well, the, first, just a, a, a comment or question, comment from me, and then a question was just that uh, this does this reminds me. It's like a um, a, a much more fine grained and nuanced um, uh, assertion about where the knowledge of colors are coming from when, um, so I, I remember from the Landau and Gleitman uh, book that they did note that um, if you ask people, you know, what the color is of an idea, uh, that they reject that. They understand something about the, um, the way in which uh, colors are supposed to work, right? And that they, they belong to physical objects. Uh, and this actually is, is a richer understanding of the the causal structure of you know where the colors are coming from for objects etc and the, the related question here was i think you've answered much of it already is that how are how are the learning processes of blind individuals incorporating temporal information for example leaves are more likely to be the same color in the spring whereas in the mm -hmm. fall they change color at different times at, at different rates uh, and however, the color of a car usually doesn't change. Uh, do blind individuals learn these patterns based on what is talked about, as you previously mentioned? Uh, um, and that was the question, but I guess to add on to that, um, uh, you know, what, how much of this is really learned from talk or learned from theories of the world, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and we actually started collecting some data um, on that very question, which is what do blind individuals know about the variation of color across time for objects? And so we're still analyzing those data. Um, kind of a related uh, thing that we already know the answer to is that Judy conducted an experiment looking at um, what blind individuals know about, or, or whether blind individuals have similar intuitions about how, how colors are assigned to objects, um, depending on whether they have daytime or nighttime usages, um, and they do. So it turns out, you know, of course, objects don't have intrinsic colors, right? It looks one way during the day and one way at night, and blind and sighted people agree that um, the way that the object looks during the day is it's kind of true color, unless um, the object is, for example, an animal that evolved to hunt at night, in which case both blind and sighted people agree that it's true color is the nighttime color. So this is further evidence that even that variation, um, it kind of has a causal model to it. Um, with regard to learning, I guess I would say that there's a lot more to do um, to actually do with blind kids, for example, to know how blind individuals acquire this knowledge. But what I would say is that I think of the process as kind of a hypothesis testing inference-based process that's partly based on other theories of the world that um, blind and sighted people share, like whether there are natural kinds and artifacts, right? And that the fact that things like function and intention exist. Um, so taking that knowledge and using hypothesis testing style um, and inferential mechanisms to learn the remainder from conversation, um, sometimes ex explicit testimony, but probably more often more implicit cues, including things like generic language, which we could also talk about more like how that would happen. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that begins to answer some of the questions. Okay, great. And also, by the way, the, the, the person asking was uh, Lasalia Sripada. I'm going to try to make sure I mention names as they come up. Great. Um, so one thing I should check in about is time, <laughs> because I have a way more material that I actually can get through. So maybe um, what is our schedule today? Um, typically, um, I... sorry, it's we have it scheduled for an hour. Um, you're welcome to go to go over if you would like. You have it's twelve forty nine right now, so we have eleven more minutes. Um, we don't get kicked off of the platform. We might lose audience because we only advertise okay. this, this as an hour long talk. Okay, sounds good. So I we started I late as well. So yeah. yeah. 
Um, well, I will keep uh, going, but then maybe I'll start skipping things at some point. Um, we might never get to the programming expertise experiment, um, sadly. Okay. All right. So um, interim conclusions. So I'm going to say the provocative thing, which is that sensory experience is not found, um, the foundation of concepts, right, to be like maximally provocative um, uh, on this point. Um, and the evidence for this is that people um, who are blind have in-depth um, intuitive theories of how color works that are shared with sighted people. Of course, this doesn't mean that we don't have sensory knowledge of color. We do. There's uh, lots and lots of evidence that that knowledge is there, it gets retrieved and used. Um, but the idea is that there is really no like first foundational and second uh, verbal kind of um, trajectory that I think a lot of theories assume. Um, and as we already talked about, um, the idea is that they're structured learning through language, right? Blind individuals are inferring um, uh, what uh, how color works from the dialogue and the things that they hear by talking um, with sighted people. Okay, right. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about um, neuroplasticity in the visual system, right? So one thing you might conclude from um, the data I've shown you thus far is that um, I was wrong and blindness is not in fact an interesting um, uh, kind of experience to study because it doesn't seem to do anything in the mind or the brain. Um, uh, you know, so I'm what I'm going to show you now is that indeed um, visual experience does have an impact, um, a profound impact on cortical organization, um, just not in our conceptual systems, but rather in the visual system. And this, um, this, whoops, sorry, um, this research gets at the question of how tightly innate um, architecture in the brain constrains the cognitive function of individual brain regions. Um, so people have asked this question for a long time about the visual cortex of blind individuals. So we've known for a while that this part of the brain activates during non-visual tasks, including things like auditory localization and braille reading. Um, and the question is, what is the visual cortex doing in these tasks and how similar or different is it from the kinds of functions that the visual system does um, in people who are sighted? And the idea often has been that there's like a nugget of cognitive similarity between what the visual cortex does in people who are sighted and what the visual cortex does in people who are blind, um, predicated on this assumption that brain regions have functions, right, um, from birth. And so what I'm gonna argue today is that in fact, what happens to the visual cortex or a large part of what happens to the visual cortex in blindness is that it gets carved up by higher cognitive functions, including language, numerical cognition. Um, I, we also have some evidence on nonverbal executive control that I won't have um, time to share with you today. Um, and But um, that this kind of dramatic plastic reorganization is limited to um, uh, the kinds of plasticity that's available during development. And so it does not occur um, in people who become blind later in life. Um, so the first evidence that I want to show you to just kind of get you uh, in the mood for the idea is um, data from naturalistic stimuli. So in this experiment, Rita Loyotile presented blind and sighted people with audio movies, right? So the auditory tracks of movies. Um, and the outcome measure here is the question of the degree to which these auditory movies synchronize um, the cortices of different participants. The idea being, um, or the question being, are the visual cortices of blind individuals doing similar things or um, are they doing nothing or are different visual cortices of different people doing completely different functions? Um, and in addition to that, what um, we're asking here is roughly speaking, what kind of cognitive operations do the visual cortices do? So to ask this question, um, Rita played uh, meaningful, rich stimuli, these auditory movies to people, and also meaningless um, backward speech stimuli, also a comedy routine, which is the thing we played backwards. And the question is, um, do you need meaning and structure to synchronize visual cortex across blind people, or is an auditory stimulus of any kind that's complex sufficient? Um, so here, the first thing I'm showing you is cross correlations across um, brains of different sighted individuals where they're listening to a six minute segment of backward speech. And what you can see is that the segment synchronizes the auditory cortices um, of these individuals, but nothing else, uh, because uh, they're, they're uh, 
semantic systems are basically not engaged, right? Um, by contrast, as been, has been shown in many other studies, when you look at the auditory movies, you get engagement of um, uh, lateral temporal cortices on the left and right, as well as um, inferior frontal and precuneus regions that are involved in semantic processing, suggesting that across different people, um, these brain regions are doing the same thing. So when you're processing the plot of the movie or predicting what's, happen what's happening next, these parts of the brain are engaged. Um, and crucially, what you find in blind people is that for the acoustic stimulus, the complex acoustic stimulus, you just get engagement of the auditory cortex. But for the auditory movies, you get synchronization, um, not only of lateral, temporal, and inferior um, frontal regions, but also of large segments of the occipital cortex. So the visual cortex seems to be doing something related to meaning, I would argue, um, in these individuals, and it's doing something in common. Um, and your very own Lisa Muz, um, who uh, was Sharon's graduate student, has um, done further analyses on these data, um, asking a different question, which is whether the visual cortices of people who are blind have common patterns of activation within them, right? So the way that she asked this question is that she broke up the, um, the movies into 10 seg segment pieces. And then she said, does segment one in one person, one blind individuals, look more similar to segment one in another person in terms of the spatial pattern of activation within the visual cortex than it does to segment two, right? So that's that on diagonal kind of circled um, black region. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you now is the map for auditory movies, more for blind than for sighted people. So what this map is showing is brain regions that show more pattern similarity across blind individuals than across sighted people. And what you find is that indeed um, in a bunch of visual cortices, both early visual areas and more secondary areas in the fusiform and the lateral um, occipitotemporal cortex, you get more pattern similarity in the blind than sighted subjects, suggesting not only are these brain regions kind of responding um, to the stimulus, but they contain a spatial pattern of activation that distinguishes different segments of the auditory movies. Um, so of course we want to know more than um, the visual cortices are involved in something uh, yay meaning uh, uh, related or structure related. Um, and so we have uh, uh, been doing a bunch of experiments trying to understand some of the processes that engage the visual system of people who are blind. This is an experiment done um, a little while back now, but it's a favorite of mine. Um, it was done by Connor Lane. Um, and so in this experiment, Connor presented sighted and blind people with auditory sentences um, of varying grammatical complexity. So they either did have um, syntactic movement or they did not have it in light red, um, but that were matched in meaning to each other. And then in a control condition, they show, um, he played participants a uh, list of non-words. And um, what we first did was to ask, um, are there parts of the visual system that are active to sentences more than non-words? And indeed, that's what you find. Um, so in blind individuals, um, visual cortices are recruited more for sentences than non-words, but not in sighted people. But crucially, what Connor showed in this experiment is that you get sensitivity to syntactic movement in the visual cortices of blind individuals, but not sighted people. So even when you take two sentences that are matched um, in what they mean, this part of the brain or a subset of it rather is sensitive to grammatical complexity. Um, okay, and across blind individuals, what we find is that those blind individuals that are better at, at answering comprehension uh, questions about the grammatically complex sentences also show a larger syntactic movement effect um, in their visual system. What Connor and Rita showed um, in a later study in a separate behavioral experiment is that actually blind individuals show superior performance to sighted people at comprehension, answering comprehension questions about grammatically complex and actually not even grammatically complex um, or grammatically complex-ish sentences. So sentences with syntactic ambiguity um, and also uh, sentences with uh, movement dependencies even when you match blind and sighted people on a range of other kinds of cognitive measures like vocabulary, math performance, um, and uh, reading speed and ability. Um, so these data suggest that blind individuals recruit visual cortex for language, but the question of course is why? Um, and one answer is that there's still some cognitive similarity that's shared between language and vision that we haven't thought of. So for example, um, they both evoke some kind of 
um, mental imagery, for example, or um, uh, there's something structurally similar, like scenes have um, hierarchical structure and sentences have hierarchical structure. This is a very abstract level, but maybe there's something shared that we don't know about. Um, so Shifra Kanjilia, who um, uh, was a graduate student in my laboratory, um, and uh, did her PhD thesis on number processing in individuals who are blind. She did a bunch of work, and I'm only going to tell you about one study. Um, so she asked whether visual cortices of blind individuals participate in mathematical tasks. So in this experiment, she compared um, uh, solving math equations to a sentence control condition. Um, so, so people saw, uh, sorry, they heard two equations and they had to say whether the value of X was the same across the two equations, or they um, heard a passive sentence and an active sentence, and they had to say whether um, who did what to whom was similar across the two sentences. When you ask what's more active for number relative to sentences in this kind of task, what you find is that for both blind and sighted people, you get recruitment of parietal cortices and also of prefrontal areas. But what's interesting is that blind individuals, unlike the sighted, are recruiting um, posterior aspects of the visual system um, in this kind of task. And importantly, we don't just want to know that the visual cortex is active for number um, number tasks. That doesn't tell us very much. What we want to know is, is it responding to um, cognitive complexity manipulations in this um, domain? So in the intraparietal sulcus, you get larger responses to more difficult equations. So equations that have larger numbers in them or equations that have um, uh, the X moved to the wrong side. So uh, instead of... Uh, you know, seven minus two equals X, you get seven minus X equals two. Um, activity in the IPS goes up with the complexity of the equations. And in blind people only, you similarly find that in the visual system, you get activity increases in um, the, uh, with the complexity of the equations. Now I told you two things now, and now I'm gonna try to put them together. So the two things that I told you are that the visual cortex responds to language and number. And what Shipra showed is that these are different subsets of the visual system. So um, there's a subset of the visual system that responds to linguistic information. So that's shown in blue. Um, the blue region is more responsive to language than math. Um, and it also responds, um, um, sorry, I forgot the label here. The dark blue bar is grammatically complex sentences and the light blue bar is simpler and the gray is non-words but this um, region does not care about the complexity of math equations and the math responsive region shows the opposite pattern. So there's also functional selectivity within the visual system. Um, and this will be the last thing that I will tell you about just because we're running out of time. Um, so importantly, these patterns of functional, connecti uh, functional specialization relate to um, functional connectivity patterns, right? So, um, the idea here is that basically visual cortex is being carved up by um, higher cognitive systems, including numerical processing um, and as well as language because of connectivity to higher cognitive networks in prefrontal and parietal cortices. And the evidence for this comes from resting state connectivity studies. So here I'm showing you the um, uh, resting state connectivity profiles of um, the visual region that responds to language in sighted and blind individuals. So first, what I want you to notice is um, this brain region is um, more correlated with um, language responsive prefrontal cortex in the blind subjects and more correlated with sensory motor cortex in the sighted subjects, kind of supporting this idea that it's switching from being a sensory motor region to being a higher cognitive region. And so now I'm bringing in primary auditory cortex to show you that this is not kind of a fluke related to S1M1. So in general, correlations with sensory motor areas go down for occipital areas in um, blind individuals and correlations with prefrontal areas go up. Um, and what Shipra also showed and then Rita showed in a different study is that that increase in prefrontal connectivity is uh, partly selective. So overall connectivity with prefrontal cortex increases, but it increases more for kind of function matched areas. So there's a larger increase in connectivity for the language responsive inferior frontal um, part um, cortex than for math responsive parts of the prefrontal cortex. And the pattern is opposing in the math responsive occipital area. So in the math responsive occipital area, there's more connectivity um, in the blind and to 
some degree also even in the cited with the math responsive prefrontal area than the language responsive prefrontal area. So just to make that pattern a little bit more clear, these are the data from the cited and blind participants just looking at connectivity with prefrontal areas with math responsive prefrontal areas shown in the darker color and language responsive prefrontal areas showed in the lighter orange color. Um, so I can, yeah, so let me, I guess I'll say um, that the bottom line is that we, um, uh, Shipra and also um, Rashi Pant in my lab um, asked whether this was true for adult onset blind participants and the same patterns do not hold. Um, and because I'm out of time, I'm gonna just uh, wrap up here um, and say that um, what we conclude from this is that um, blind individuals learn, um, do structured learning uh, through language. Um, and uh, the second conclusion from the visual cortex data is that cortex is highly cognitively flexible um, early in life. And so I'm going to skip over the, um, you know, the computer programming study now and just get to my conclusion and acknowledgement slides. Um, so, right. So the, what I want to argue, um, even though I haven't shown you the programming data, is that the human brain um, combines specialization and flexibility to enable learning. So the idea is that we have powerful learning mechanisms of which language is one for conveying information from one brain to another, but at the same time, the conveyal of that information actually changes the brain itself. Um, and in order to, to make that possible, the brain has to be highly flexible um, early in life, highly cognitively flexible, such that a given piece of cortical tissue can assume um, a number of functions and change to suit the specific environment um, that the human finds themselves in. So to end, I wanna thank um, all the um, clever people who did uh, this wonderful research in the laboratory that I've named along the way. Huh? Uh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, the other important thing that I like to do is um, thank the blind participants and sighted participants, and in particular, the blind community for um, supporting our work and enabling the research, um, and of course, our funders. And thank you very much for listening. And I'm gonna applaud for everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I can uh, lead the discussion here for uh, questions. I don't know whether you can see the questions coming up now. Uh, I quit out of the presentation, so I now okay. can see the question. So I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna try to make it. So now that I don't need my animations, I can, you know, you could show see you things. the slides okay. if you want. Okay. Yeah, I can see things. Uh, Okay, yeah. well, thank you. And we can I see that questions. at least two people clap, Anna, Anna Shapiro and, and Joe. Yeah. There we go, three. High five back. <laughs> yeah, so okay. I love questions because, of course, this is all still being worked out. So, okay, so, uh, yes, yeah, so let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. We've been answered uh, um, the questions as they came up. Um, uh, so, Let's see if, I'm waiting to see if anyone's gonna type in anything. Sounds good. But I will also ask a question while that, that's happening. Um, so I am, am struck by the, the functional organization findings that you have at the, the, that you presented at the end of the talk uh, within the cortex. Um, and uh, do you have any, um, uh, and the connectivity patterns that you saw. Do you have any reason to um, explain why those particular patterns are emerging consistently within um, the blind, those particular parts of the visual cortex? Yeah, that's. I think that that's an important, a really, really important question that you know provides an opportunity to kind of really say what it means for something to change. So one, one, the way that I take these data is um, that. Uh, functional flexibility is possible while maintaining the same structure, right? So we don't have any evidence that um, there are major uh, fiber pathways um, that are forming in people who are blind, nor would that really be consistent with the way that we think that the brain develops. Um, so the, the idea is that there are pre-existing pathways from um, these high level systems into the visual cortex um, and that they exist there um, and are used by sighted people for other reasons. So for example, 
for when you're talking about the things that you see and when you're modulating your mm -hmm. expectations mm -hmm. about what's going to be visible um, and that there are these specific connectivity patterns between parietal areas and prefrontal areas um, that play one functional role in the sighted population, but then play a different functional role in people who are blind. And the reason that you end up with the systematic pattern is that in both cases, um, you know, experience is building on a shared structured substrate that's present at birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting if it is something like, uh, yeah, uh, connectivity that would be used for the direction of vision to language is now sort of running the other way or taking advantage of that pathway. Yeah, um, yeah so one kind of slight piece of evidence that that might be happening is that one of the kind of, you know, we, we observe these language related responses in a bunch of the visual system. So there's no yeah. like one spot, but one, so it, it includes V1, but one of the areas where you see very large effects is um, in the region where the VWFA is. And so um, one idea is that why does that, you know, in both the sighted and the blind participants, this brain region is not doing whatever it evolved for, right? That's mm -hmm. the claim. The claim is like, this is not a, this is, of course, this is an unusual phenomenon in a sense, but I think it's not an unusual phenomenon in another sense, like brain regions are getting co-opted and modified by experience mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. All right. And then there are questions that are coming up and I don't... <laughs> I'm not used to this interface. They seem to be moving around due to the votes and things. So let's, Joe asked a question. Maybe you can see Joe's question. Uh, let's see, given the increased demand. Oops. Given the increased demand to learn slash infer concepts from language alone, is there evidence that blind individuals have more precise slash better differentiated knowledge of certain concept categories, perhaps abstract concepts? Um, so Joe, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, it, this is something that I've started to think about more recently. Um, and so I'm going to tell you something, but, but the bottom, I don't, um, I haven't, I've gone at this question in a slightly different, uh, way. So I agree with you. And I, I think it's increasingly clear to me that language is a really important source of information for blind individuals. And that manifests itself in a couple of ways, right? So one is, as I mentioned before, blind individuals perform um, a little bit better than sighted people on sentence comprehension tasks with that when there are no visual cues available, right? Because everybody's blindfolded. Um, so that's one piece of evidence that partly may relate to plasticity, but partly may relate to the pressure, right? The idea that blind individuals are getting a lot of information from language. There's also evidence that blind individuals have superior verbal memory, so they're better at remembering lists of letters and numbers um, in the right order relative to sighted individuals. So I think this kind of evidence, as well as the fact that a giant chunk of the visual system is recruited for language, suggests that um, is consistent with the idea that blind individuals are using language as an important tool to learn about the world, and that's reflected in their behavior on language. With regard to abstract words, um, I guess what I would say is like, I think all words are abstract words, like blue is an abstract word too. Um, and actually I think the first person who I talked about this with um, when I was a graduate student is Dolphine Dahan, <laughs> um, who who might be here. Um, so yeah, so, so I think, I don't know that I could find um, differences in knowledge and abstract words in particular, because I think there are abstract aspects to all words. Now, um, we did find actually that blind individuals have um, more coherent uh, representations of auditory sound verbs, um, like ver verbs like cling and bloop. Um, so that's, you know, it's a small difference, but it's kind of an interesting difference where the visual verbs are preserved, but the auditory verbs are a little bit enhanced, which is kind of maybe an interesting thing related mm -hmm. to your question. Yeah. Okay. And then, um... Uh, I see a question that says, following up on John's comment, John's question, my question, I guess, is the, is the lateral occipital activity localized to what is typically MT in sighted individuals, given the yeah. strong thalamic inputs to MT? I'm curious if that could indicate subcortical plasticity. Um, that's a good question. So um, trying to figure out like which functional, visual functional areas line up with um, blind individuals' responses is obviously a challenge. So roughly speaking, the language-related responses on the lateral surface 
seem to be localized around um, LO, I would say, but it's it's difficult to tell because obviously we cannot localize um, these brain regions, the functional brain regions in um, in the blind subject. I will say a couple of things, which is that, you know, one of the things I mentioned before is that these effects are found throughout the visual system. Um, and none of the effects seem to respect the visual hierarchy. So for example, the visual um, responses to language are observed in LO, in the posterior fusiform, um, and, as well as in V1. And that could have to do with a number of factors. So one is that possibly these, um, so one kind of phenomena that could be happening is, for example, more anterior uh, visual areas that are kind of directly abutting language regions could serve as a gateway for this information to enter the visual system. And then because we're using fMRI, right, we're not looking at these effects precisely in time, they just spread all over and to us, it just looks like it's simultaneously everywhere. Um, another possibility that I think is quite possible is that there's direct um, uh, pathways to V1 itself. Um, and yeah, so, so the answer is, yeah, that's the, the, the best we could do at the moment. Yeah. And let's see, are there other questions that I'm missing, I guess, down lower here? If you want to scroll down and see if there's something you want to yeah, answer, see. that probably would be easiest. Oh, do you observe any visual areas with overall decreased activity in the congenitally blind participants? Um, or do you believe that regions are repurposed to their full capacity um, from RE? And um, I think uh, we don't observe any regions with reduced activity. However, there is evidence um, from anatomical studies of some atrophy in the visual system of blind individuals. It's not clear uh, where that atrophy is coming from because one of the things we know is that actually some of the inhibitory mechanisms in the visual system don't develop in the same way um, in uh, blind individuals and sighted people. So actually it could reflect too much activity rather than too little. And there's evidence that in fact, there's just higher metabolism in the visual cortex of people who are blind than sighted if you do like a pet experiment. Um, so I, I don't think they're being used in the same way. Um, I think the other question that your question kind of um, begets and implies is the question of functional relevance. So I've shown you no data really that give a knockdown um, argument for the idea that blind individuals um, visual cortices are uh, doing the hard cognitive work of language, right? I've just shown you that they're participating. Um, and we know that blind individuals also recruit prefrontal and lateral temporal regions. There is TMS work, for example, from Amira Medi showing that you, um, if you TMS the occipital pole, you get verb generation errors in blind individuals. You can get braille reading errors um, with TMS as well. Um, so I do think that they're contributing functionally but um, what, one thing that we do not know and won't um, really ever know, and I suspect is not true, is um, if a person was born without their frontotemporal language regions, would the visual regions be sufficient to support language? I doubt it. <laughs> so. So, um, yeah, actually, and now a question, if you scroll up, there's one that got two votes that says, what role do you think? I guess I could read that. Uh, what role do you think the visual cortex is playing with respect to behavior in blind individuals? The spatial correlations in blind individuals during the auditory stories are super interesting. Several studies have shown topographic correlations with visual cortex of blind individuals. How do you think this architecture is being utilized by blind individuals for behavior? Right, so there's a, you know, this, this is very related to the previous questions and there's a bunch of things we know and a bunch of things we don't know. So one thing we seem to know is that in fact, visual cortex plays a functional role, a behavioral role for blind individuals um, in both higher cognitive tasks and non higher cognitive tasks as well. So we know it's functionally relevant, but exactly what it's doing, um, you know, relative for example, to other areas, we, we don't know. So based on its functional profile, um, I would say that some subsets of it are probably participating in the same kinds of functions as the middle temporal gyrus and the inferior frontal gyrus in language processing, like sentence parsing and um, uh, retrieval of word meanings, right? That would be the, the inference based on the fMRI data. And then the math uh, regions are uh, participating in solving math equations. Exactly how the visual cortex does that um, I don't know. I don't know the answer for, you know, bro Broca's area either. Mm -hmm. um, so 
it is, it is, I mean, I think that is the, the next challenge is that we want to figure out how it's doing it. Another version of your question is, is the visual cortex doing anything unique? Um, and that, that again, I think is an open question. So far, the data that we have suggests that its functional profile looks similar to other areas, but we are uh, searching hard to see if there are any cases where even though it's activated during sentence processing, we can identify some differences that might have to do with the anatomical constraints that are present in that part of the brain as opposed to um, classic language areas. So right, hopefully I've answered, but if there's more, then let yeah, me Yeah, related question there is that, do you, do you think that uh, blind individuals who've record, recruited visual cortex actually are better at language or have, uh, uh, different language abilities uh, for that reason. And I know you have a little bit of evidence related to that, at least I, I've seen some on garden path recovery, but I just would be curious to hear your thinking on that right now. Yeah, so, you know, my thinking is that we have a little bit of evidence um, that blind individuals are better at some language tasks. You just mentioned it, the, the best evidence we've got is um, this behavioral data show, showing better um, recovery from in, in garden path sentences, um, better comprehension mm -hmm. um, question answering in that context. But I guess there are two things to say about that. So um, uh, one thing is that while blind individuals are better, they're not behaving like, um, you know, super com computers, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, they they're recruiting a large part of the brain during this task. And nevertheless, they're they're just somewhat better. It's not like mm -hmm. um, they're totally different. You know, performance benefits on verbal working memory tasks are substantive. You know, mm -hmm. blind people can remember twice as many um, letters mm -hmm. um, or words. Um, so th there are uh, substantive differences, but um, Right. So, so I guess what I would say is there's not a one to one relationship. It's not the case that if you just recruit more brain, you're going to get um, more uh, equally uh, uh, larger benefits um, uh, for performance. The other question is that I mean, it's, it's possible you could see like qualitatively different solutions, but you don't see that's that. That's right. Effect, right. That's I mean, right. And I think part of the reason for that is that, you know, we're not testing people who don't have classic language areas. This is addition rather than, yeah. um, you know, replacement. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? Or I, I see our, that uh, Heather is back. So that probably yeah. means something. That was, yeah, I'm back to do the wrap it up. Okay. It was totally fascinating. And um, uh, we still have 40 people who are online. So this talk has been recorded. It will be available in a few minutes. Um, and I just, I wanted to let Marina go because I know that she actually has a meeting in seven minutes. <laughs> okay. So okay. Uh, I wanted you to have a chance to get a break and take some water, but thank you so much. Yeah. For, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Our series this year. And for um, anybody who's still online, um, you may have figured out that we actually do not know who our second speaker is just yet because we're still finalizing the schedule. Um, but as soon as it is available, it will be posted here on um, Crowdcast and also on the MindCore homepage. And if you follow uh, MindCore here on Crowdcast above, you will get updates when um, we have events. We're also, there are also some um, auditories, uh, seminars that we are um, hosting here um, for one of uh, another research group within that's whose work is related to our, to what we do. Um, so you'll see those as well listed. Um, so thank you very much again. Yeah, and thank you. to everybody else, have a good weekend. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs>